I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Glory I'm saved, glory I'm saved. My sins are all pardoned, my guilt is all gone. Glory I'm saved, glory I'm saved. I'm saved by the blood of Another hymn or not? I'm ready. I'm ready. That's it. Start it up, man. I do like singing. I, I, I think it's outstanding. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. That's found in Colossians three sixteen and over in Ephesians chapter five. But I like the Word of God. I like hearing it preached and taught. Not me. People say, "Hey, do you listen to yourself?" No. I wouldn't listen to me if I didn't have to. Acts chapter 4, that's what Karen's been telling me for 35 years. Acts chapter number 4, man. Amen. Acts chapter number 4. We often say Acts, but it's actually Acts of the Apostles, is it not? Yeah. Uh, you do not have any apostles today. I don't care what they say, how they name themselves. They're phonies, charlatans, and tricksters trying to take your money with false doctrine, using a Bible to try and mess you up. But most saved people, unfortunately, don't read their Bible. And if they do, they're not underneath any preaching and teaching where it's rightly divided and shown how to be applied to your life and keeping Jew, Gentile, and Church of God separate and all that. So they think a guy with the title of apostle with white hair, hearing aids, and glasses is really an apostle. He's not. He's a liar. He's a fraud. But I'm glad we have this book to go to. It's a historical book, but it is a book that does have doctrine. But you need to know the apostles' doctrine and how this thing starts out and the transition that goes through here. We will not cover all that this morning. That's an AP class on Sunday night. <laughs> Acts chapter number four, please. Take a look at a, a man that I admire greatly in the King James Bible. And we've been going through a bunch of different characters and different folks that typically have had no names, not a lot of recognition, but God used them. Uh, God can use anybody that's yielded to him that has a heart that's willing to save him, uh, that, uh, a heart that's willing to serve him. Uh, hopefully you don't save God. He doesn't need saving but a heart that's willing to, to serve him and a heart that's uh, desirous to follow after him, he can use you. Well, here's a man that's, I think, one of the coolest guys in the New Testament. Man. Verse 4, uh, I'm sorry, verse 31 says this, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake with tongues and in language nobody understood. How come they never go to that passage right here? The Bible says, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that were believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that out of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Now, we're not going to have a give it all Sunday this morning. You don't have to bring your house keys up front and your car keys and all that stuff. Don't get freaked out. That's next Sunday. <laughs> Verse number 36 says, In Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, that's his last name, his proper name, his family name. So he's Joseph Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Thank you again, Father, for the morning, opportunity to look into your Bible. Thank you that it is the very mind of Christ. I believe that, Father. I believe it's inspired, it's pure, and it's preserved. And Father, it is absolutely everything we need for this life. And Father, more importantly, for the life to come out in eternity. Thank you for saving our souls. Thank you for making a way for our souls to be saved through the greatest price ever paid for man's sin, the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son. Thank you, Father, for the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Please, Father, use me to bring honor and glory to yourself this morning, and I would just be thoroughly happy if you preached and taught this and not me, and I pray you would do so. Thank you again, Father, for our great Savior, our great King. Thank you for this book. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. So let me, you can sit, David. So if you'd like to stand for the whole thing, we could do that, man. It'd be like Ezra, man. They stand till midday and they just read the whole thing. 
Baptist, and you're not going to make it that long, man. You're being like five minutes. I need a snack, <laughs> and I got to go get a water, and I got to go get a you know. I'll eat mints in the back because that gets my blood sugar up a little bit. I'd like to start out by saying this. We're going to look at Barnabas this morning, the son of consolation. I'd like to say this as we go through this this preaching and this this teaching a little bit about this man is that nobody gets to where they are in life, but particularly a saved life, on their own. I know the Lord saved you. I know He did it all by Himself. He didn't need help to pay for your sins. It was the Lord Jesus Christ that bore your sins in His own body on the tree. He became sin for us who knew no sin. And I understand that, that He alone is a, the one responsible for saving your soul. But then after that, the Lord is also responsible for your growth, but He always interjects people into your life to help you along the way, whether you like the, that or not. Uh, you're not a self-made man. You're not a pull-yourself-up-by-the-bootstraps kind of guy. That's why the book of Galatians was written for you and I, is that you're saved by the Spirit, but now you're going to prove to everybody how spiritual you are in the flesh. Just saying that goes against the Word of God. You're going to show people how spiritual you are in the flesh. It, it doesn't work. Well, the same thing goes in your, your Christian growth, is that God will surround you and put people around you to help you out and to help you grow. There's folks in this congregation that have helped me grow in my walk with Jesus Christ. I hope I've been a help to you in your walk for Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that to, to get amens or you come up. If you stick me in the ribs, I'd be just as happy. I'm serious. Then I know you really love me. You know, you Joab me. I like that stuff, man. But you're not going to get to where you are in your life without the help from somebody else. You need people praying for you. You need people ministering to you. You need people around you to encourage you, exhort you, to get you to come along. Because guess what? Left to your own devices. Well, you already know what we do when we're left to our own devices. Left your own imaginations and thoughts, man, and just by, you'll cook up some weird stuff, man. So I'm glad that people invested in my life uh, years ago. I was saved in 1984. For three years, you would not have known that. And it's not laughing. There's no snickering or joking. It's actually shameful to think I'm going to have to give an account for that. But that's the way it went. And I, I can't go back in the time machine and undo that. But fortunately, in the spring of, I think it was uh, spring of 87, I believe it uh, if I remember correctly, the spring of 87, uh, somebody called me up and said, hey, would you like to go to lunch? And I'm like, well, I have free food, man. I'm in college. I don't have any money. And the dining hall is horrible, and they won't let me eat more than like, you know, four Captain Crunch things, man. I'm like, no, man, of course I'll go out there. So we went to Debbie Wong. If you guys remember, you know, you know Debbie Wong. You guys remember that? Yeah. It's the only place you can be right is a Debbie Wong, man. It's the only place where two Wongs make a right, man. And this guy called me up, and I, I didn't know him from Adam. I'm like, oh, what's this guy going to do, man? Of course, back in that day, Brian Bosworth was a hero to everybody. So I had my head tight on the sides with two stripes on one side. And the, yeah, I was a cool guy, man. I'm a cool guy, man. You know, you guys have seen the picture. I was a cool guy back then. Yeah. I, I know, thank you. <laughs> right down, yeah, Megan gets one seat, you get the other one. <laughs> But he, he, he calls me up and says, hey, uh, I'd like to get together. We didn't take you to lunch and all that stuff. And I, I got the lunch. And I said, I kind of knew. I kind of knew where this was going. And he gets to me. He goes, uh, he goes, so your brother tells me that you trusted the Lord. I'm like, I knew this was going. I said, yeah. Scram for, you know, some wontons or some cookies or do what I can. To, <laughs> so, but he was, he was on me. Actually, he wasn't on me. The Holy Ghost was on me. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, I'd like to get together with you and start meeting with you. Uh, every Monday or two, wherever you want to, wherever you want to go, and I'll swing by and pick you up for church. Well, where do you think this started? Number one, the Lord saved me. Number two, He put people in my life. I don't know where I'd be without somebody discipling me. I, I don't know where I'd be if somebody had not come along and been a son of consolation. Who is Barnabas to anybody? Does anybody really consider Barnabas as one? I mean, he's an apostle over in Acts 14, 14. He is an apostle. But the reality is, do you think of him as part of the 12 or even part of the 70? Do you even think of Barnabas as being any more than just a, a run-along guy? But I'm glad he's there, just like I'm glad that uh, the, the man's name was Jamie Carter. But, I mean, anybody, a uh, guy that has his first name, Jamie, you got to run away from him. But I, I didn't. But, and the Lord hooked me in. You know, you know what he did? He took me out in public. Put, put me in, didn't put, huh, that's Ryan, I was going to say he put me in jail, he should have. But he said, hey, we're going to start a ministry with uh, the, the juvenile youth, and 30 years later, I was still in jail. I, I'm still preaching in jail. <laughs> and he goes, hey, you're, you're going you're gonna to preach one night at the old folks' home. I'm like, what do you mean? Well, you're going to preach one night at the old folks' home. Just get together with the Lord, and I said, well, uh, what am I supposed to preach? He goes, I don't know, God will tell you. Thanks. <laughs> but I'm glad he did that. You, you see where that is now? And why do it to you guys? Yeah. So you'll have that benefit, man. Yeah. Yeah. 
Not to just sit and be another stinking lump on a log in a, in a pew. Somebody took the time with me. A, a Barnabas came along and said, hey, I heard you got saved. Let's go do something for Jesus Christ. Well, who's going to know about that unless somebody comes along and tries to help you out? Well, that's a good thing. I'm glad he did. And then, you know, opportunities to preach and teach and all that stuff. And here you are 35 years later, man. So you can blame it on him. But that's the way it rolls. And, you know, God will do it for you, man, if you let him. And uh, if someone wants to come along and helps you, uh, help you, don't turn that aside, man. Yeah. You see Kenny crying, it's not. <laughs> Why would God use any of us, man? You know this church is made up of people that have invested in me and I've invested in them. That's who it is. Yeah. Have you noticed that? That's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. I'm glad Chuck's here. Yeah. I'm glad Isaac's here. Yeah. Bert, I mean, you have no idea, man. This maverick stuff doesn't work in the Christianity, man. I've tried it. It doesn't work. And I'm glad Barnabas, I'm, I'm saying this for this reason. You don't think about Barnabas, but would you have an Apostle Paul without Barnabas? Would you have an Apostle? I know the Lord saved Saul on the road to Damascus. I know he washed him clean, and I know he, I, I know he saved him and all that, but where would Paul be without Barnabas? Where would you be without somebody in your life to teach you this book and invest in you? Folks, we've been spoiled around here. Yeah. I'm not saying it because of me. I'm saying we've been spoiled about the preachers we've been around, the same people we've been around. You can think bad or ill of what's happened to you in your Christian life, and but we've been spoiled, man. I look around this room, we've been spoiled by the Bible teaching and doctrine we've had, the tapes we've had access to, the people we get to go see down in Ledyard and, and all over the place. We've been spoiled, man. Thank God for it. Because you don't know where you'd be sitting right now. I'm glad for people like Barnabas to come in your life, and I'm glad that somebody came to assist me in my walk with the Lord, and you know, when he passed off the scene, other people have come in and all that stuff, and that's the way it, it's gone, and we're not a finished product, but God brings those folks along to help you in your growth. Look at the Bible says to me right where we're at. I want to say this as we get going. Verse number 36 says, And Joseph, who, was by, the apostles, uh, who by the apostles was named, uh, surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation of Levite, the country of Cyprus, having land sold it, 4, 437 now, having land sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. I want to say this right off the, right off the bat. This boy was a giver. He was a giver. He saw other people's needs and went right after them. He was a true minister. We went through the book of 2 Corinthians uh, uh, a few months ago, and the one thing you learn about the ministry is you've got to be willing to give of yourself. If you're not willing to give of yourself, stay out. If you're a hireling, stay out. If you're a wolf in sheep's clothing, we'll kill you. Stay away. This is eternal stuff. Barnabas, right off the bat, said, you know what? I want you guys to know that I will give whatever I can to help you guys out. I'm all in on this thing. And I will give whatever it takes of myself and of my, what I have to support the work of the ministry. I hate fringe people. I hate people. You, you say, well, this sounds repetitious. It's good. It's good repetition for you. I hate people on the fringes that are not all in. If you're going to be all in for evil, be all in for evil. Don't tiptoe around it. If you're going to be all in for God, be in all for God. And you're going to mess up, and you're going to fall away, and you're going to get upset, and you're going to get ticked off at other Christians. You're not going to want to go to church. Stick to Jesus Christ in the King James Bible. He'll never fail you. He'll never let you down. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Men will forsake you. Preachers will forsake you. Pastors will kick you by the wayside. I wish to God it wasn't true, but he never will. But this man Barnabas saw something, and the apostles said, you know what, whatever they got, I'm in on. I hear their doctrine. I hear what they teach. You know that from chapter number two, at the very end when the apostles' doctrine, breaking of bread and fellowship and all that stuff and prayers, Barnabas had to see that and he goes, man, I don't care. I want in on that thing. Something's going on for God and I want in on it. And I'm willing to give whatever it costs me, man. I'm willing to give whatever it costs me. Look at uh, Philippians chapter number two. Philippians chapter number two. Look at a little bit of Bible this morning. We didn't have much at Sunday school, so I figured you could get a little more this time, man. Yeah. 
<laughs> Philippians chapter number two. Folks, we are a dying breed. Yeah. We're dinosaurs, man. Hymn books, prayer, tears, laughter, ragging on each other, yeah. King James Bible. Yep. We're, we're dinosaurs, folks, I'm telling you. Uh, who even knows where Obadiah is? Yeah. Or Nahum. Then he's going to throw in a little Zephaniah to mess you really up, man. That's a curveball on 0 0 count, and you're looking for a fastball. I'm glad for that stuff, man. There's more to your Bible than Jesus wept in John 3 16. Oh, that's blasphemous. No, it's not. You're stupid and you're lazy and you don't read your Bible. Yeah. Philippians chapter number two. Verse number one says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Who does that nowadays? Me, 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 iPhone, iPhone, Snapchat, Instagram. Look at me. I love me. Look at me. I'm going to the bathroom. I'm making a grilled cheese. Look at me. Look at me. I'm posting. I'm texting. I'm a Shut your mouth. It's not about you, it's about Jesus Christ if you're saved. Yeah. And you're supposed to look on the things of others, not to gossip about them, not to be a talebearer. You're supposed to see, how can I help them? What can I give of myself to help them in their walk with Jesus Christ? Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't really like that. I don't know, they're different than me. Yet, what do you think they see when they look at you? Yeah. You either have no friends or no mirrors in your house. Because yeah. you're not that pretty to look at or worthy of investing in anybody. Somebody did invest in you, didn't they? Somebody took the time to come along and, and, and Barnabas, Barnabas you along the road. Well, you pass it on down to someone else, man. You know why we're here today? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. But did you read over in Ephesians where it says that the apostles and prophets are built on top of that, him? And we're here because we get to read Peter. Uh, uh, well, Bert, you don't read Peter and James. But I mean, the, the, uh, Paul, uh, Romans of Philemon, because we're narrow-minded and we're hyper dispensationalists and all of this stuff. But we're here because of the foundation of Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, and the apostles and prophets on top of that. You're here because somebody invested in you 2,000 years ago, man. And that's why we get to read this Bible and have a good time around the Word of God and turn all those crazy books in the Old Testament because it's there. You know what? Because God was looking on the things of others. They're going to need a book. They're going to need the Holy Ghost. They're going to need my son's blood. He looked on the things of others, and he's God. But yeah, when it comes to you and I, we don't look on the things of others, man. Uh, we don't very rarely. I'm glad Brother Bert keeps pricking me in the heart when he says that stuff about learn to remember or uh, pray for each other. That's not as easy as you think it is. I know we make kind of, I'm not making fun when I say where you sit and you move, you mess me up. I have to discipline myself to do that. Because I go through my day and I don't think about praying even for myself. It's just go through, well, I read some Bible. Yeah, but did you pray before you read the Bible? Did you pray before you stepped out the door? No, it's just, you know, let me just go at it. It's like Christian genealogy, or, not, or like genealogy, not genealogy, where just throw a wish up and see what comes down. Oh, it's going to be a good. No, you need to ask the Lord in everything, man. And that will help you look on other people. When you, now, last week I did, I'm not contradicting myself. You need to pray for yourself for wisdom and things of that nature. That's biblical to pray for yourself for certain things. But you need to look at other folks and say, man, I'm concerned about them. I can at least start praying for them, and then God will give you an opportunity to minister to them. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Please. Barnabas started right off the bat and said, I'll, man, I'll give it all up. Now, I, I, know that, I know I made a joke about it earlier because it's just a joke to assuage my conscience, but the reality is, what happens if God said, give me your car? Give me your house. The house I allowed you to buy, but actually the bank owns, so it's really not your house. Yeah, I know. It's my house, my land. No, the bank owns until you pay off the note. But what happens if God said, why don't you give that up for me and for the work of the ministry? Barnabas said, I'm, you know what? I don't care what it costs me. Those folks are all in. You know how I know they're all in? Because the next chapter, what did Ananias and Sapphira do? They hold it back. You go, so you got two opposing views of Barnabas, the right heart, and Ananias and Sapphira, who held back about the wrong heart. And God said through the apostles, why are you lying to the Holy Ghost, man? What are you doing that for? So Barnabas had the right heart. And you know, if the Lord came down and said, why don't you just give it all? I've told you before, out in Rochester, they used to have give it all Sundays. I'm not kidding you. Those guys, I'm not, not joking, those offerings were five figures and above. When I say five, I'm, they were getting close to six figures. Quiet, isn't it, man, right there? 
I'm dead serious. I know it for I know that I know the count. I didn't know what anybody gave, but I knew the count. Give it all Sundays, whole paycheck, whole month's salary, right in there. That's Barnabas, man. See, you know, it was all it was all fun a few minutes ago, and I enjoyed it, and I'm I'm glad the Spirit of God did that for you. But the reality is, is that when it comes to my stuff and my things, Barnabas had it right. I don't have it right. Because I still think everything I have in this world belongs to me, including my life. And it doesn't. It belongs to Jesus Christ. If it's scriptural, you're bought with a price. Look with me over in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. Verse 14 says this, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you. For the children not not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And I will verily gladly, and I will very, very gladly spend and be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Paul had it right too. But let me ask you a question. That's the Apostle Paul right there in 2 Corinthians 12, right? Who came alongside and trained the Apostle Paul? We're going to see in a minute. Where do you think Paul got the understanding that it's not about me, it's about what I can lay up for the generations down the road? And the spiritual inheritance I can leave behind is far greater than any monetary inheritance I can leave behind. What you leave behind spiritually is what's going to last for all eternity, folks. The house and the car and the lands and all those wonderful things. Okay, that's great for how long in a, in a child's life that you've left that to. But if you're saved and they're saved, an old Bible that's left behind with answered prayer on the back of it and verses on that stuff. No, Herb, you're not getting my little Bible. That's tucked away. That's buried, man. Only Kenny gets to know where that is. Polly and Kenny can fight it out for that one. <laughs> May have be fun, man. I'm just saying, what's your spiritual legacy, man? What are you going to leave behind? What are you going to lay up for the next generation spiritually? Part of the reason why these guys are up in the pulpit is for them to see if God's calling them to do something for the Lord. But it's also to get them out of their own stinking shell of comfortability and laziness. i got to preach Sunday. Okay, maybe it'll tighten up your prayer life for the next four days. Or you can just send up a Hail Mary before you get up here, you know what I'm saying? But it should get you in your... It's, it's, part of it's a discipline, man. To get you out of yourself, to get you in that book, and to get you alone with God and see that you can leave something behind. Uh, sometimes you just think of Sunday school and, and teaching the Word of God is just passe, and i got to check it off the box. Well, we just go to Wood Lake, and who's really listening? God holds what you teach and preach absolutely accountable. What you said and preached in jail, what you said and preached on the cor- street corner, what you witnessed to your neighbor, God has taken account of every one of those words. And it's deadly important, spiritually and eternally important, that you... Leave something behind for the next one coming. Barnabas said, you know what? Pfft, I don't care. What, what, what's this? You know what? What's this? What good is this going to do me down here? But we love ourselves too much, and we love our flesh too much, and we love comfort too much. I'm saying we because I'm in on it with you. And the Lord just keeps peeling away more stuff, and I hope he keeps peeling more away of it. So you can get like the Apostle Paul. None of us are like the Apostle Paul. You, you, we don't do any of this stuff, man. We should, but we don't. Barnabas said, yeah, you know what? I'm going to set the example right off the bat. Go with me over to uh, Acts chapter number 9. We've got to get moving here. Acts chapter number 9. Acts chapter number 9. Acts chapter number 9. Look at 23 with me. Acts 9, 23. And after that, many days were fulfilled. The Jews took counsel to kill him. And their laying await was known to Saul. And they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the, uh, by the wall in a basket. I told you, him and Moses are the first basket cases in, your, in, in the world. And when Saul was coming to Jerusalem, he said to join himself to the disciples, but they, but, this, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. What was, what was Saul doing uh, 35 verses earlier? Or, excuse me, 26 verses. He's killing Christians. Then he meets the Lord, changes his whole life, changes his whole eternity. And now he's like, hey! And they're like, No! <laughs> They're like, let's see your Baptist registration card, man. Are you independent, fun for male, charged hell with a gasoline squirt gun, blah, 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 blah. He's like, no, I just preached Christ. I just got saved a little while ago. Oh, you can't come in here, man. You can't come in here, man. Oh, no, we can't, we can't have you down here. Oh, and you got those weird tattoos on you? you? Could you go get those removed before you come in here? Oh, and that weird green hair and those, those piercings. I mean, Christians don't have that. Hmm. Really? Okay. Well, thank God for Barnabas in verse number 27. But Barnabas took him <laughs> and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly to Damascus in the name of Jesus. Thank God Barnabas said, you know what? This guy's okay. Hey, he's one of us. Aren't you thankful somebody invited you to church one day? 
took in a bunch of those, bunch of those sicko, single-minded, narrow, bigoted King James only people. Yeah. I'm glad for it, man. I'm glad for it. I'm glad. I'm glad a Mormon didn't come by and grab me. I'm glad a, a, J, a Satan's witness didn't come by and grab me. Um, he may have been the 144,000th and one, and he wasn't chosen by God, so it wouldn't have counted when he pulled me into their, their... If you guys don't know what that means, it's Revelation 7. We'll talk about it later. I'm just saying, man, thank God Barnabas came along and said, no, he's okay. I've heard him preach. I know what he believes. Come, come on, let him in, because the apostles are going, no way, this guy's a murderer. Do you know what he did to my kid? Do you know what he did to my wife? No, he's all right, man. Yeah, but did you hear his... I know we don't do that. I'm just saying they did that 2,000 years ago. That's all gone by the wayside. We're all saved and convicted by the Holy Ghost, and we do what he always tells us to do. But there, uh, you, can't, you can't tell me there's no whispers going on there. Do you hear what he did? Man? He's, a, he's, a, he's a killer, man. And Barnabas says, no, Paul, come here. Come here, let me bring in. You know what he did? He brought him into the fellowship of believers. I'm glad my brother took me to hear Dr. Ruckman. He goes, you're going to hear a guy that is off the hook. That's all he said. That's in 19, it's the summer of 87. And he goes, you're just, he goes, just sit there. I said, come on, man. He can't be that special. He's not. The Holy Ghost in him was. And I was just like going, there's no way anybody knows that one thing so well. And it addicted me. I'm glad somebody took me to church that night to hear him. He was there the whole week. And there was a bunch of other preachers there, and I remember them too, but I'm telling you, the thing that stuck out to me was somebody took me to the Fellowship of Believers. They're like, oh, oh hey, where are you? Oh, you're, Mark, you're Mark Brown's brother? I said, yeah. You know, and all of a sudden I said, is that good or bad? Or what is that, man? Oh, so you're Little Brownie. I said, no, I'm Big Brownie. <laughs> That's Little Brownie right there. But I'm glad he took me in. I, I, don't know, I don't know what would happen if nobody grabbed you and took you to church or nobody spent some time with you. Aren't you glad Barnabas grabbed Saul? And now you have Romans of Philemon. You say that's not that big of a deal. Oh, yeah, that's the way I read it. Because what happens if Saul runs around, he's preaching Christ, and he's praying and all that stuff when he gets converted, and, and then he, he's there, and, and nobody comes along. He's like, wow, this is pretty useless. Is there anybody else out there? I mean, I, I, I know they didn't like me, but, I mean, does, does anybody care about me now? I mean, I'm preaching Jesus. I'm doing what they told me to do. Does anybody care about me? That's why I appreciate this church. I really do. We talk to everybody as much as we can. Well, I'm not talking to Isaac Labor. I mean, I mean, we talk to as many people as we can. And we're, honestly, there's a good spirit in here, a little less. There is. And I hope we keep that. Because when somebody walks in that's not your skin color, or not your stripe, whatever that means. I just never learned. What are you walking around looking at people's stripes? They got a tail too? Well, they're not of our stripes, so you know what? We have to kind of, you know... No, how about you just take them in like you got taken in when you were a baby, didn't know jack squat, nothing, and you sat there and they all came over, shook your hand, all that stuff, and said, hey, how are you doing? What can we do for you? And you're like, wow, people actually, they like me. I know every church has its problems, I know, but I'm glad that we talk to people, man. I'm glad that we go around and, 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 and have a good time. I, I really am, that's, that's, because that's part of Barnabas grabbing the son of consolation. You know what consolation means? It's to leave misery. It's to bring comfort to somebody. But it's also to strengthen them and to support them. It's consolation. It's important, man. You think it's gay. Well, no, it's not gay, man. It's a good, it's a good Bible word. And thank God for Barnabas. And said, you know what? Saul, come with me. They're a bunch of narrow-minded knuckleheads. But just come with me, and I'll, I'll explain to them what the deal is. And they took him in, and look, where, look what we got now. I like that. Now, go with me to 2 Timothy. You know where I was going to go. 2 Timothy chapter, uh, actually not 2 Timothy, I'm sorry, that, that's incorrect. Go to Matthew, uh, Matthew 11. Matthew 11. I mean, folks, if you don't have the right heart towards people, if you, I don't know if you've noticed that our world is even weirder now than it ever has been. And people don't know what they are. Uh, they're making themselves to look like animals and beasts, which I understand from Psalm 49. Man being in honor, understand that, like the beast of the field. I understand that. They're heading back to the beast thing. But, you know, when you see people walk up and they got the green hair and the shaved sides and it's a female, but it wants to be a boy, how are you going to minister to that person if you don't have the right heart towards God? When you see a dude that's just completely sleeved up with tats, inks all over, uh, ink all over the place, and just completely disheveled, got the you know the chain with the wallet, you know, and you look at him, you're like, this guy. <laughs> don't tell me you don't do that. We've talked about it a thousand times, and every time you say that, they take the track from you. Yeah. And the nice white person walking by in the suit says, "Get out of here," and flips you off. Yeah. 
You don't know what God's doing in somebody's heart. You don't judge on the outside like man does. You're supposed to judge like the Lord judges and say, you know what, here's the word of God. Would you take and consider your eternal soul? Yeah. I'm just thinking, oh, I don't, know, I don't know, man. They look kind of weird. So don't you. But we've developed this arrogancy and cockiness to save people where, look at me now, I'm saved. I don't do anything wrong. No, nothing that, you, that can't be seen that you do in secret. Matthew chapter number 11. You know what I like about the Lord Jesus Christ? He talked to anybody anywhere. You know, you know who Jesus Christ ragged on the most? The guys that had the Bible. Pharisees. Scribes, hypocrites, whited sepulchers. You got that book and no heart to live it. I'll go talk to the publicans and harlots. They'll listen to me. Oh, geez, you hang around publicans and harlots? Yeah, they actually, they actually care for what I have to say. But we have that weird thing in our prejudice in our churches, even our quote-unquote scriptural churches is so weird, man. Well, they don't look like me. They don't talk like me. They don't bring a tie with them when they come to see Dave Brown. They're not going to, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> Matthew 11. Verse 16 says this, but whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, We have piped unto you and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you and ye have not lamented. But John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He hath a devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber. Imagine saying that about Jesus Christ. But look what the comma after wine bibber includes a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. Man, you know who often heard Jesus Christ the most? The common people. Regular folks. You know what Jesus Christ did in Mark chapter 1? You know who he touched? A leper. And you can imagine that leper just trying to reach up what he's got left of a body and an arm and a hand, and he reaches up, and, and, and nobody wants to go near him. We saw that last week. It's just a horrible thing. And the leper reaches up his hand and says, would you heal me? And you know what the Lord says? I will. And he's healed. Jesus Christ touching a leper? Yeah, if the Lord can touch the unsightly and unclean and filthy, guess what you and I can do? You ought to get a good dose of going on the street or going and preaching in a jail. You ought to go to a nursing home and see folks that aren't like you, that don't have two legs and two arms and two eyes and two ears, and eyes, that can see and hear and taste. You ought to go get a little, just a little bit of inoculation with reality. Yes. Instead of living your little fishbowl life as a saved person yeah. and not caring about anybody else around that's not like you. Our churches have done such detriment over the years, it's unbelievable, man. Because you know what? We look on the outside and on the inside. God doesn't care about your skin color. He cares about your sin color. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. He cares about your sin. He doesn't care about your skin. You get saved, come on in. Praise the Lord, man. Or you come on in, you're not saved, come on in and get saved. Praise the Lord, man. You know what? God will weed that out through the preaching. Brother Guido will remember this very, very vividly. You will remember this, though, hopefully. I know you're older now, but take some shark cartilage. You'll get your memory back. Man. <laughs> or an electrotherapy. Remember the two guys that used to sit in the back? The, the, maybe you, the, the, the son and the father, and they were both sodomites? They liked you more than me, which is kind of weird. I'm still trying to write a reason out, man. <laughs> Two, a father and son in jail in orange, sodomites. Well, did you try to minister them? Sure did. Preached the Word of God, man. Shook their hand. They didn't come back. Well, did you chase them out? No, the Word of God handled that. Yeah. It's not my job to sit down my, and look down my nose at them and go, oh, man, they're weird. Did you see the tat they had? Did you, did you see what they were wearing? They had Nikes on. Nike satanic. We don't, I know we're laughing, but we've done that to people. You wonder why they don't want Jesus Christ. Because yeah. they see him as just some stuck-up weird snob. That's not the Jesus Christ of the Bible. And you know what? Barnabas had that same mentality. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go snack. You know, all these people are saying this guy's a murderer. So all these guys are saying he, he takes women and children, throws them into prison. You know what? I, well, I, I heard him preach. He's got something there. Let me go grab him. Let me bring him into the fellowship of believers. What a great thing that was. Go back to Acts chapter 11. Uh, Acts chapter 11 with me, please. We're getting there, man. We're, we're moving. I get fired up about this stuff, man. It means a lot to me. It really does. 11.22 says this. Barnabas was also a firm believer and a practitioner of discipleship. You've heard me say this before. I believe this is the thing lacking in our churches. 
true biblical discipleship is missing. Not only did Barnabas grab him, he brought him in, but it didn't just stop there. You know, kind of like the guys used to hand out discipleship lessons and say, go do this and get back to me. Yeah. Where's the investment, love, care, and concern in that thing? Here, just take this piece of paper fill it out. And that's the way discipleship is done. done. You know why discipleship is not done in our churches? Because it takes time and sacrifice on the discipler's part to actually go out and invest in somebody. And God forbid I give up my time in anybody else's world. It's not your time. It's his time. And when you take it back, that's a real God robber. That's God's time given to you and I. And when you take it back for yourself, and I all know we have downtime. I'm not ragging on that. I'm saying when God says, go do that for me, and you say, no, I've got my own time, God says, thanks for robbing me. And you wonder why you're on the shelf. You wonder why your prayer life stinks, your Bible's dry, and you, have no, you can't get along with anybody in the church. Well, I know why. Because everything's back to, you're saved, but everything, you own everything, and it's all yours, and it belongs to you. And I'm not, well, bless God, you're not going to move me. And your favorite hymn is, I shall, I shall, I shall not be moved. Yeah. And that's the way it rolls in most say people's lives. Barnabas wasn't like that. Look at the Bible says with me in verse number 22. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which is in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas. Wow that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man, and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. Well, he's always after going after Saul. And when he had, Saul must have been a bad dude, which, of course, we know Saul's name gets changed to Paul, which I understand the problem. Verse 26, And when they had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with, get, uh, to get, uh, assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first Antioch. That's the first time Christian shows up in the King James Bible. It has to do with investing in people's lives. And Barnabas is right there with Saul and teaching and training other people in the Lord. If God has given you the ability to teach that Bible, you know somebody, it's your duty to pass it on down the road. It's 100% your duty and your, honestly, it's a privilege to be able to teach people the Word of God. It's not like, oh, man, I, just, I get to be the boss of everybody. And everybody. No, man, you better be living what you're teaching, or at least attempting to live what you're teaching. That's where true discipleship comes in. That, folks, we've been very good for years on evangelizing, right? We've been very good at you know, baptizing them. And then what do we do typically? We, we throw them to the labor. And then they get burnt out, and you wonder where they're at. It's the old win them, wet them, and work them deal. Win them, wet them, work them. And you wear them out, man. They're just done. The mule's done. They can't plow anymore, man. They're frothing at the mouth. They can't, they're, they're, they're worn out. Saved? Where are they? Because someone didn't come along, I believe, in, in that, that stage, okay, saved, then just get baptized. But, okay, before we start laboring, can we just sit down and learn a little bit of Bible? Can I spend some time with you and show you how to witness and maybe take you on the street and show you how to talk to people about the Lord and how to pray and get a prayer life going and how to read your Bible and how to, you know, disciple in the Word of God? Could I do that? No, it's, we, we've lost that, folks. That's the engine in the rear end of a car not being tied together. And you wonder where are all these people at and where are all these folks allegedly got saved. And I don't blame the Lord for that. I blame me for that, me personally, for not grabbing on as many people as I could have over the years and train them up and disciple them. You know, you know why a lot of folks aren't in churches right now? Because I failed. Because you failed. That you had something that you could have gave to somebody, but it would have taken your time and your effort and, and your heart, and you wouldn't do it. Because you either love money or you loved yourself or you love something else. And now, oh, where's that person at? Well, maybe it's because of you they're not here. Well, I don't mean to get, come to church and get guilted all the time. You ought to feel guilty about that one. I feel guilty about it. Because there's been a lot of people that I could have invested in more than just the ones that the Lord has given me a chance to minister to. I got time or I'll make time. If you want to kill me, you know where I'm at. I'm here at the street, golf course once in a while, or, or church, or street ministry related stuff, or I'm, I'm, I'm home. Doing surgery on my wife's other knee. <laughs> I'm just saying, man. Well, you can, we find the time for everything. We do, man, but not for the things of Jesus Christ. So you're a partial, you're a half-stepper, man, which means you're really a no-stepper. 2 Timothy, quick, 2 Timothy, please. Familiar passage, I know you're worn out with it. I'm not. Because somebody came to me and invested with me and lived this verse for me. 
2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 says this, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. The same commit thou to faithful men who should be able to teach others also. I'm not going to get tired of that. That's four generations there. That's Paul, Timothy, right? Witnesses and faithful men. There's four, there's four there. So why are you and I here today? Because somebody with somebody with somebody with somebody ended up teaching the one who taught me. So now it's my duty and privilege to pass it on down the road to other people. How dare you keep that to yourself? How dare you keep that to yourself? After everything God has given to you and I. How dare you keep that to yourself? Oh, I only follow Paul. No, I only follow Paul where I like his doctrine, where it doesn't mess with my life. Like pretty much every other spot in the Bible. Selective reading and more, and worse, selective obedience, which is 100% disobedience. The Lord said, you know what? You go out and win them. You baptize them, obviously. But you need to spend some time with them. If you can, I understand. I mean, Taylor led a girl on the street this four years ago now. I mean, she was from a different state, I think, Tay, or something like that, right? She was, yeah, I mean, but you could give her maybe a church if you know of a church or give me a phone number or something like that. I, I know there's, I, I understand there's circumstances, but don't lean on that as the rule. That's the exception to the rule. The rule is most of the people you deal with get saved because you have one-on-ones with them. They know you, they watch you, you witness to them, and they get saved. It, that's your opportunity to, to not pass them off. You grow in your own walk with Jesus Christ underneath the preacher or teacher you have or the disciple you have, and then guess what? You start discipling them, or if you can't, you bring them into where you're being trained at. I cannot get everybody. And I know people say, oh, Moses was wrong for taking uh, advice from Jethro. There's a great pattern there. Moses, you're going to wear away if you don't train somebody. You handle the stuff that's the big stuff, and you teach folks how to handle, your leaders, how to handle the stuff that you can't get worn down with because you've got bigger stuff to do. You say, what's the New Testament principle of that? Don't you have folks in Acts chapter number 6 that have to handle the daily administration? Well, those apostles just think they're all that in a bag of chips. No, they are. They are. They're to give themselves the prayer ministry of the Word, but I need some folks to help me hand out the food. I can't do it all. But I can invest in somebody who can go get somebody I can't get. That's the way it's supposed to roll, man. Barnabas saw that. You know what? I'm not just going to go grab Saul. I'm going to go on the road. I'm gonna, we're going to teach together, and we're going to invest in people's lives. But it's going to take a sacrifice, folks. And whenever you say sacrifice, look out. Acts 13. Acts 13. Acts 13. Would there have been an Apostle Paul at the level he was at without Barnabas? I don't know. I don't know. I like to think that Barnabas, the Lord used him in such a way to give us our Apostle, man. Acts 13, verse 1, uh, 1 says, Now there were in the church that was in Antioch certain prophets and teachers of Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene, uh, Cyrene and Manaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord and fasted. Uh, as, excuse me, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. And you can, you can go read the rest of that. But go, <laughs> go over with me to Revelation chapter 19. You know what I like about Barnabas in that passage? He was, he was a vessel ready to go. Revelation chapter number 19. I, I mentioned this last week. I've mentioned probably the week before. God is not going to use a dirty vessel. God wants that vessel clean, not pharisaical clean or white sepulchre clean, not even for men. He wants to see that heart on the inside. He wants to see that thing. But it, we are, it isn't coming upon us to have a good fellowship with the Lord, man. Absolutely. Can two walk together except they be agreed? No, they cannot. I know you're staring at me. You can't. If he walks in the light, you're supposed to walk in the light as he's in the light. You can't have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, Ephesians 5. You're not supposed to hang. There's things that God requires of us. Not this weird separation where we don't touch anybody like the leper and all that stuff, but it's a, it's a personal, everyday holiness. Not whether the way you dress or what you watch or don't watch on TV, whether you have a TV or don't have a TV. Brother, I'm convicted. I'm going to have to go and smash my TV after Sunday school. <laughs> Next year, but I mean, you know, but or, or your or your phone or YouTube or what it is you whatever it is you you fancy yourself. I mean, 
uh, it, it, it's your personal everyday walk with Jesus Christ. It's getting to be more like him and less like you. And God says, you know what? I'm looking down there, and the Holy Ghost says, separate me. Barnabas and Saul. I want those two. There's, there's other guys in the list. There's Niger and Manet. They're in the list. But he says, no, you know what? Those two right there. You say, what's that about that? I think he personally made some decisions in his walk with Jesus Christ. Look what the Bible says to me in Revelation 19. Verse 6 says, And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, and the vo as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Handles Messiah. Hallelujah. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. That's going to be cool, man. And his wife hath made her... Did you read that? And, her wa and his wife hath made herself ready. You say, what's that have to do with anything? Read verse number 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Look at this. For the, the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. That's personal righteousness after you're saved. Come on, man. You, the, the, the folks that, you know, you're, you're married in here, did not your, your woman, your bride, or as Paul would say, your chick, <laughs> it, did, didn't you want... I know, that's blasphemous, Kenny. You're, you're gonna, you, I can see the look right now happening. On the ride home, I say, don't you ever call me chick. <laughs> it's chica. <laughs> Bert, don't blow, blow a lung out, man. I know he's, all right, he's, like, he's half dead. I'm like, that's going to put him over the edge, man. But didn't you want your wife to look the best she could? That was incumbent upon her to get herself ready for her husband to be. Wouldn't it be great? You say, well, yeah, what do you think the judgment seat of Christ is for? He's going to purge out all that dross. That fire hits those works. And you get all, rid of all that stuff you accumulated since the day you got saved, whether it be good or bad in your flesh. And here comes the, and here, here comes the bride. Fine linen. But that fine linen has to do with your own personal righteousness. She made herself ready. I can imagine Barnabas going, I cannot be used to the Lord unless I have a good walk with him. It's not weird religious pressure. It's, man, I don't want to be an unclean vessel when the Lord calls upon me. You know why? One of the reasons why we don't witness very much is because of some unconfessed sin in your life, which leads to fear and ashamedness and all kinds of other stuff. And we're not, well, it starts with that root of pride and self esteem and all that stuff. It's sin, it's unconfessed sin, man. And you know, you get a little blemish on the wedding dress and you get a little mascara running, and you're like, you don't look the way you looked once before, and you're a little bit unclean. Barnabas wasn't like that. The Holy Ghost said, I want Barnabas and Saul. Why don't you pick the other guys? I don't, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the other guys. I'm just saying, why'd you pick those two? I'm going to read you some. Well, actually, let, let's go there together. Let's go to Chronicles. i got, I got to show you this in Chronicles. We're, we're going to get as far as we get, and that's okay. I'm not, not worried about it. Go to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles. This is a great passage, man. Has to do with that personal holiness and that personal practical holiness. Not like I said, not some weird. You're floating above the ground, you know, four inches with a halo around your head. No, it's I can talk to people who are not like me, but I love Jesus Christ. I'm going to keep myself clean. You know what? You know, like the, like it was going on in the '90s and all that stuff. Well, I just go to bars, man. Why do you go to bars? Well, I'm trying to relate with the people, you know. What? Do you understand the balance between that? Well, I don't, I don't go there to drink, you know. I said, okay, so if somebody sees you lifting a glass with ginger ale in it, what do they think they're drinking? Yeah. What happens when they see you with a nice dark brown root beer bottle? Yes. They don't know that it's root beer. Why well, just go, you know, we're not talking about that where I'm all things to all men and making an excuse so I can start listening to ACDC so I can win ACDC to Christ. Yeah. You, you didn't need to pick Van Halen anyway. Not Van Hagar. It's got to be Van Halen, man, if you're going to do it. Thank God you guys don't know what that is, man. Most of you don't. So, oh, thank you, thank you. Altar's open, Guido. 2 Chronicles 30, verse 13. And there assembled at Jerusalem much people to keep the feast of unleavened bread in the second month, a very great congregation. Verse number 14. And they arose and took away the altars that were in Jerusalem. So they're purging out all the idols, and Hezekiah is doing a good job, a very good job. They took away the altars that were in Jerusalem, and all the altars for incense, incense took they away and cast them into the brook Kidron. Then they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the second month, and the priests and the Levites were ashamed 
and sanctified themselves and brought in the burnt offerings of the house of the Lord. And they stood in their place after their manner, according to the law of Moses, the man of God. The priests sprinkled the blood which they received of the hand of the Levites. For there were many in the congregation that were not sanctified. Therefore the Levites had the charge of killing of the killing of the Passovers for everyone that was not clean to sanctify them unto the Lord. For a multitude of the people, even many of Ephraim and Manasseh, Issachar and Zebulun, had not cleansed themselves, yet did they eat the Passover otherwise than it was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them. See, he said, oh, I can get away with it, preacher. I can get away with it because I have somebody interceding for me. It's God's mercy we're not smashed. Did you just read that? Some of them, that's like your 1 Corinthians 11 thing. With the Lord's Supper, they ate when they were unclean against the Word of God. Why weren't you clean? Spending too much time with those idols, man? Why were you not holy and sanctified? Too much time at the, at the, at the old place, man, with the old gods? You're having a feast here, man. We're having a revival. And some of them were clean and some weren't. Look what the Bible goes on to say. For multitude of the people, in verse 18, even Ephraim, Manasseh, Iscar, and Zebulon had not cleansed themselves, and yet did eat the Passover otherwise than it was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, The good Lord pardon everyone that prepareth his heart to seek God, the, God of, the Lord God of his fathers, though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. And the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah and healed the people. See, I can get away with the preacher. No, no, no. That's, if you, that's what you, your heart's wrong. Your heart's wrong. You should have a personal time of, Lord, I'm wrong today. Lord, I've got some pride rising up right now. Lord, I've got Barnabas, he's prepared, man. He's ready to go. You know how you get prepared for something? You hit it ahead of time. I'm a procrastinator. That's going to shock you, but I like to procrastinate. But then I can make up for it, I think, and make it right. And the Lord says, no, you prepare up front and hit that thing. How many times do you have to show up late to somewhere? I get, uh, I'm not picking on brother. It's, it's really good to see him, but he sends me a text. He goes, we're here. It's locked. And then Revelation 3.20. It's a horrible human being. I take back everything I've invested in your life. I just suck it right back, man, right now. Let me text some Bible verses to me. I'm the preacher. I don't get convicted. But he's like, well, you know why? Because I was ready to go at 930, but then I saw a couple hairs I had to trim, and then it's 939. And it's 11 minutes here. If you don't get the Antichrist driving in front of you with a handicap sticker. <laughs> It was, you know, you know what I'm talking, you know what I'm talking, I, I know the hand of Christ is a he, but she might be a he, she, this was a woman with a, and it's, it's 35, I know, it has a five in it, you put a one in front of it, it's a three, and if you're saved, it's 55, I'm just saying, man, <laughs> but <laughs> you'd learn, but I mean, why don't you prepare ahead of time for that stuff? Lord, I know that I have an opportunity to do something for you, but oh no, I'm just going to preach in a week so I can live like the devil for six days and then get ready. Oh, Lord, I, I got to go to Wood Lake so I can live like the devil for four days and then go get ready. That's what we all, we're all guilty of that. The Lord says, no, I saw Barnabas. He was a ready, prepared vessel, meat for the master's use. He made himself ready up front. He prepared up front. He didn't let, just let it catch him off guard. I like that. Let's, let's do this. We're just, it's just the way it's going to roll. That's okay. Acts 13. Acts 13. Acts 13. Acts 13. Let me get there. I'll have to shut it down on this one. That, and that's, that's okay. I'm not worried about it. Acts 13, verse 44 says this. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Hey, that's like the St. Patty's Day parade. Awesome. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing he put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turned to the Gentiles. That's a real good passage in your King James Bible about the transition in the book of Acts from Jews, uh, the Jews as a nation to the Gentiles individually. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to, ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas. There they are again. And expelled them out of their coast. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy 
and with the Holy Ghost. They were not deterred. They were not swayed. And they weren't scared about what was going to happen to them. Barnabas is right there. And he says, oh, you don't want to hear us? Oh, you want to blaspheme us? You want to make fun of us? Do you want to hurl insults at us? You want to, you want to raise up people to contradict us? You know what? We'll shake the dust off our feet and go on to the next one for people that do want to hear us. But it didn't deter them from what the Lord had told them to do. It didn't deter Barnabas. He's right there with, he's right there with Paul. And he's not getting freaked out. He's like, okay, let's go to the next town. What happens with this in save, save people's lives, they come up against, this is usually what happens. You get saved, and you start witnessing for the Lord, and things happen. You get, some folks get saved, or they're really happy. Oh, that's good for you, and oh, wow, oh, oh, I'll take that and read that. Sure, that's really cool. But then the Lord kind of gives you that. It's kind of like a little bit of a, you know, a sugar stick up front. Keep you kind of interested a little bit. And then about, oh, about the 10th witness down the road, 7th to 10th witness down the road, somebody just flips you off and loses their mind on you. That's where most say people go, this isn't worth it. This is not worth it, man. I, I, I can't do this, man. I mean, my friends and my family, my family doesn't even talk to me. You know, the family was once, oh, that's good for you, honey. I'm glad you found religion. But then when you say, no, auntie, no, mom, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And if he saved me, he'll save you. And I want to see you get saved because I don't want you to go to hell. I'm not going to hell. Who are you? And before you know it, your family castigates you, throws you out, says no way. And you know what say people do? They may not do it on the outside, but they do it in their heart. This is not worth it. This, this is too much. I didn't sign up for this. Or when death comes your way. Or cancer comes your way. Lord, you saved me. What is this deal with cancer? Yeah, you're saved, but you're still down here in a sinful, sin-sick body until the rapture or death. And a lot of preachers and a lot of folks don't share that and teach that to save people that, guess what? You're going to have trials and tribulations and suffering in this world until Jesus comes for you. And a lot of saved people get so, they're like, oh, I thought everybody would love me that I got saved. I thought everybody would be so happy that I, no, they're not going to be. And that's okay because the Bible is very clear about that. Barnabas said, you know what? Let's shake the dust off our feet and keep on going, Saul. They could have got discouraged and said, no way. Too many quitters in Christianity, man, when it doesn't go their way. I'll tell you a quick story, and we've got to wrap it up. The first, the first person the Lord ever let me lead to Christ, his name, kid's name was Tim Stott, S-T-O-T-T. -T. He was from New Bedford down that, that area. And he's a baseball player. So we, we had something in common that in that realm, I was a sophomore, he was a uh, freshman, or I was either junior and he was a sophomore, what, whatever, we're, we're a year different. And I can remember showing him from the Word of God and, and leading him to Christ. He, he, he told me he got saved, he believed it. So he gets on the phone and calls mom and dad. First call. And he's joyous, man. It's just like, it's real. It took, man. And his mom and dad said, what's that? Oh, I, I, mom and dad, I, 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 got, I, got, I got saved. And they said, you better watch out for that. Your brother dated one of those. And he was over the house. And they, you know, the mom's telling Tim the story on the phone about, you know, this family, I don't know if they're saved or not, but they, you know, brought out candles there, like a prayer. So I, I, don't, I don't know. It could have been voodoo. I have no idea. But your, your brother, your brother got, was dating one of those, and they were crazy. And, 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 and we just said, stop seeing her. Tim would never let me talk to him about the Bible again. That's why I still pray for that kid. Don't know if he's alive, don't know if he's dead. But you say, what's the big deal? He got punched in the face with something that was negative to his experience with Jesus Christ and said, my family's... Now, I'm not bragging on him. The kid literally was saved. It's, this is within 24 hours. He gets on the phone and he's happy. He's joyous. He's like, I'm going to go tell everybody. And then he called mom and dad. And mom laid the smack down. He said, I can't, I can't blame him, man. He didn't have any... I, I barely had pins under me, man. What are you going to tell him? I just knew enough to lead him to Christ, show him from the Word of God. And, and then what am I going to do? Show him that, you know, well, well, let me take you to 1 Thessalonians. And let me take you to Acts 14, 22, and let me take... I didn't know that, man. That tribulation comes and anguish and pain and sorrow to save people like it does to lost people. But I have an anchor of the soul that can get me through it. He didn't, he didn't know all that. And so I never got to play baseball, same team. 
Same call sheet, pitcher on the same pitching staff the whole nine. Never got a chance to talk to him about. It. You know why? Because he got he got hit in the face with opposition. Barnabas said, "You know what? Oh, you don't want us here. You don't want to hear us here. We'll go to the next city. Oh, you don't like us here. Let's go to the next town. I'm not going to stop because I love my Savior. I'm not going to quit. I'll shake the dust off my feet. I'll remember to pray for him. But I'm moving on down the road. Folks, you've been some of you folks have been saved 30, 40, 50 years here, and maybe you've quit in your heart a couple of times, but you're back." And the Lord took you back and said, good to see you, prodigal. Glad you came home. But there's going to come probably another time where you want to quit. Or say, I, don't, I, I just can't go anymore. This is just too rough, man. Well, think about Barnabas, the son of consolation. And think of the investment he made in a man's life years and years ago. And now we have Romans the Philemon. He's our apostle. And he, he saw something there. And that man, and you know why? Because he had his own personal walk with Jesus Christ. It's quite the character, man. Uh, there's so much more, but we are not going to hit that this morning. Brother Justin, can you pray for Actually, you know what? I'm going to have Brother Isaac, can you pray for us this morning? Brother Isaac Raymond, can you close us in prayer, please? Sorry, Justin. I'll... Father, thank you for this opportunity, Lord. It's so good to be in the house with these people, Lord. Father, thank you for the preaching of the Word out of that King James Bible. Father, thank you for giving it to us, for giving us the ability Father, I pray that it would move us and change us, Amen. Lord, that it would modify our thinking, Lord, and renew our minds. Father, that we would have the same kind of burden for lost souls that the Lord Jesus Christ did here Amen. on this earth. Lord, thank you for that blood that washes away the sin. Lord, we know that before Jesus Christ, of course, it wasn't washed, it was covered. But Lord, thank you for washing it away. Amen. Father, I pray that your name and your word would be magnified not only in this place but through us as we go out into the world and see others <clears throat> father that you would be pleased yes with your bride lord we love you father we praise you in the precious name of jesus amen amen, amen. <coughs> five o'clock